and uh, Sri Ashutosh Jindal, Joint Secretary, Ministry of Petroleum and Natural Gas. Uh, Professor Kirk Smith has extensively worked uh, in the uh, area of global environmental health at the University of California, Berkeley. And uh, those of you who have received the invite along with his biodata and the area that he has worked in will realize that he has been working in India for the last uh, 40 plus years. And uh, he has seen, and his work uh, also in Nepal on the smoke-free chulas. I got, a, I, got a, I got an email from the former water minister of Nepal, Mr. Deepak Gyavali, once he received the, when he received the invitation. And he was remembering your fascinating work in Nepal as well. Over the last few months, I have been in touch with uh, Professor Kirk Smith. Uh, we were working on our third year volume on the Narendra Modi government. And uh, I had requested him through the kind offices of Ashutosh ji to contribute a chapter on the ongoing revolution that is called Ujwala. Because uh, we realize that there's something phenomenal happening on the ground. We have often heard Prime Minister Narendra Modi speaking about the effects of Ujwala, the positive effects of Ujwala that is actually happening. And then we have also heard him speak in detail about how the segment, the rural women, the largest segment in India, the rural women, are seeing their life being transformed through this initiative. So therefore, I thought it would be very interesting to first request him to contribute a chapter for our book. The book is in print now. It's ready and it should be launched in, uh, in a couple of days uh, from now. Professor Kirk Smith agreed. And I think that was uh, phenomenal because uh, not often does one see an academic from the West speaking positive of what is happening in India. He is one of those rare uh, species, I guess. So he agreed, and I think that uh, chapter that uh, he produced was really very interesting. And then uh, we decided that since he was here, he keeps coming to India, but since he was here, uh, why don't we just call him, invite him over for a, uh, for a talk, uh, so that we understand firsthand from him as to this phenomenon and how it is transforming Indian society right at the grassroots. He goes around because he does a lot of field visit. And then it so happened that Ashutosh ji also could give us some time because he himself is a practitioner. He is uh, deeply involved into this entire movement among the top few who are actually spearheading it. So I requested him to come and uh, he had to walk about for two kilometers because the traffic is so bad today. <laughs> but nevertheless, so you know, we waited a little for him. So, um, so I would then, uh, I think, uh, ask uh, Professor Smith to start your uh, presentation. And then we'll uh, have remarks from uh, Ashutoji, And we'll end the discussion. Thank you so much. And I, we are delighted to welcome you here. So thank you very much. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and to talk about the Ujwala program and the um, provision of clean fuel to the women of India. Um, I'll preface my remarks by saying, yes, it's a, it's a very pioneering program on a global basis. India is uh, suddenly, very quickly, making a big difference in provision of clean fuel to Indian women. And this, you know, hasn't happened uh, in India. There's been a steady growth of LPG, the clean fuel that is the first thing that people use after they stop using biomass. It's been a steady growth in that, you know, to the middle class as they come in, as your kids, uh, you know, grow up, they take on uh, LPG. But there hasn't been a growth in the poor population. There have been about 700 million people using LPG, I mean, excuse me, using biomass since the early 1980s, but no progress. So um, 
somehow India had developed substantially since the 19, uh, when I first started work here in the late 70s, and you go back to those villages today, people have satellite, you know, they have satellite dishes, they have cell phones, they have motorbikes, they have, um, you know, water connections, they have Pukka schools, better roads, but they're still using chulas. Well, one of the things we've learned in this period of time is that the health effects of the uh, chula use are substantial. We always guess this because of the high pollution levels, but now there have been hundreds of studies around the world that document those health effects. And many of those done in India, but some done in Nepal and other parts of the world. The estimate now is, you know, a, almost a million deaths a, a year, premature deaths a year, are due to the use of chulas. So this isn't the biggest single risk factor in the country, but it's a very large risk factor, and a million deaths is far too many. And then, so I'm going to uh, go through a bit of about the uh, Ujwala program. My, my title is, you know, past, present, and future is a little bit of each. It's a little bit intimidating with Ashutosh here because he runs the program, knows a lot more about it than I do. But um, let me just give you my perspective. So um, I always show this picture because uh, this was the first woman in human history, as far as we know, to have her air pollution level measured doing the oldest task in human history. Why do I think it's the oldest task? Well, our definition of becoming human was learning to control fire. And that happened 1.8 million years ago. So this is the oldest task by definition. This was in Gujarat in 1981 near Anand where we did the first measurements. And we found, you can see she's wearing an air pollution device. We found air pollution levels in order of magnitude above even the dirtiest cities in the country. And indeed, um, you could probably have stopped with that one study um, because the levels we've found since are very similar, but it's, um, we've done hundreds of such studies now, enough to have the distribution of that air pollution um, across the country. So, I mean, there are a whole bunch of stuff in biomass smoke. Some people think biomass smoke is natural, so it must be good for you. It's not. It's got a whole range of toxic materials. Uh, not the place to discuss these, but um, one way of looking at them is to consider how it compares to cigarettes. Many, most of us, uh, most people recognize that cigarettes are a cause of ill health, a considerable cause of ill health. So how does this compare? Well, I mean, um, based on small particles, which is the best metric of comparison, it's equivalent to three or 400 cigarettes an hour being burned in the kitchen. Now, I want to say this, it doesn't mean the woman is, cook is smoking the four, three or 400 cigarettes. That would be a horrendous thing. It means she's having, if you like, 200 cigarette smokers over for dinner, and they're smoking once every 30 minutes. I mean, it's just a lot of smoke. It's like being in a really smoky pub. Kitchens are small. If you've got 200 smokers in there, it's going to be very smoky. So when you see the health effects, think of smoking. The same health effects, the same diseases we see for biomass smoke as we see for cigarettes, of course, greater for a cigarette smoker because they're sticking the burning stuff in their mouth. The woman is not sticking the burning stuff in her mouth, but she's still exposed to it, and of course, her small children are as well. Now we understand the distribution of these exposures across India, you know, and it won't surprise you to see that there's the exposures are less in the south than they are in the north. Um, some states have more exposures than others because of cultural practices or poverty or, you know, higher use of biomass and so forth. We understand these now. And the burden of disease, this is the burden of disease, um, as it's expressed internationally, show that the highest single risk factor in the country is high blood pressure. And, you know, this is the, the part of the country that is becoming modern, is, you know, getting high, you know, has um, high salt diets and other issues that lead to high blood pressure high uh, glucose, which means uh, that's why the diabetes epidemic is important. But the air pollution comes in third and fourth. And ambient air particle air pollution is third, and household air pollution is fourth. Well, how much are these? I mean, this is a, you know, a metric related to the um, lost life years. Well, it's about almost one million premature deaths a year occurring in India from household fuel use. Substantial burden of disease. And of course, the two kinds of air pollution together exceed any other type of air pollution. So you, India is in a very unique situation of having a tremendous amount of traditional air pollution in households from chulas, 
and a tremendous amount of outdoor air pollution these days, you know, Delhi being one of the worst places, as you, not this time of year, fortunately, but in much of the year. Now, are these two unrelated? No, they're not, because we believe that 25 to 30 percent of the outdoor air pollution in the country comes from chulas. Different estimates. Our estimate is 26 percent. An estimate out of Harvard University is 50 percent. An estimate out of IIT, probably the best of them, was 30 percent. So some big number, some large fraction of the outdoor air pollution comes from chulas. Now that's not surprising. Two or three days, two or three times a day, 170 million households burning dirty fuels. Well, it may start indoors, but it doesn't stay indoors. It goes down outdoors, it goes down the street, and it contaminates the neighbors, it becomes part of general outdoor air pollution. So I don't use the word indoor air pollution anymore because it implies that it's only indoors, but it's not only indoors. It contaminates all the environment. So we use the term household air pollution now. So part of that outdoor air pollution is actually from households. So households are actually the largest environmental health risk in the country the total from their own direct exposures and the downwind exposures from outdoor air pollution. So what's happened? 1980, um, you know, there was a growth of, um, of uh, clean fuel use. You can see there was very little clean fuel use in 1980, but it grew rapidly. And so, you know, we've got um, hundreds of millions of people using clean fuel, mainly LPG. The population as a whole grew over the entire time, and the solid fuel use stayed the same. 700 million people still using solid fuel. There was no progress. And, you know, a colleague and I um, looked at that, um, uh, called it the Chula Trap. 700 million caught in the Chula Trap. Now, what about improved biomass stoves? There have been programs in India and Nepal and elsewhere, you know, so-called improved biomass stoves, stoves designed to save fuel in biomass fuel and supposedly less dirty. Well, unfortunately, it's turned out to be very difficult to design biomass stoves that are truly clean. I'm a health scientist, and I would never suggest a biomass stove of any type as a health intervention. Now, they save fuel. The better ones save fuel, and that's a social benefit. But I'm a health scientist. I'm trying to reduce the health impact. So I consider them not sufficient. Um, so what has been done? Now, I'm not going to go through the long history, of the, or not so long history, but the interesting history of the development of LPG programs in the country. But in 2015, the uh, you know, Modi government essentially decided they were going to do something about this. And they initiated three major programs. The first is the Paul Hall program, which didn't actually introduce uh, LPG to any uh, poor households, but it greatly uh, made the uh, subsidy system much more efficient by directly, you directly um, deposited the subsidy in people's bank accounts, greatly reducing the potential for people using it, uh, misusing the fuel. Not entirely eliminating it, but greatly reducing it. Um, the um, direct deposit of refill, LPG, all LPG is sold at market prices, economists like that, but the uh, Subsidies deposit in the bank accounts, and of course it's famous because the first month that happened, it, it, met, it got the Guinness Book of Records for the largest bank transfer in human history. And then, an even more brilliant idea is that, you know, subsidies, everybody in India gets the subsidy for LPG. I mean, currently, um, it's, um, you pay 450 for your cylinder, your refill, and it's, uh, the subsidy is about 50, you know, it's small this month, it's only 50 rupees, it goes up and down. Um, the question is, the problem with subsidies, economists don't like them because they do distort the market, but more, but in one sense, more importantly, it's very hard to get people to give them up. Countries have fallen, governments have fallen because of, the Egyptian government fell when they tried to get rid of kerosene subsidies. So countries don't really like to, you know, eliminate subsidies very quickly because um, people will complain. So the brilliant idea was not take them away from people, ask people to give them up. And you will all remember the Give It Up program. There was a huge uh, social um, media campaign on it. The Prime Minister mentioned it in speech after speech. You got an award, you got a letter from the Prime Minister if you gave it up. Um, you know, and the, old, I mean, the middle class, um, represented by pe you people here, I mean, maybe that subsidy meant something, you know, 30 years ago, but it doesn't mean much now. It's, you know, the few hundred rupees a year. It's you know, hardly even a meal out with your, your family. So yet 
for poor people, that, subsidy, that amount of money is substantial. So for whatever reason, and this hasn't been investigated very well, the middle class responded in a dramatic way. I thought I was actually part of the group that thought we well, might get you know, one or two lakhs. No, no, it's no 13 lakhs, or no, 13 million people, 130 lakhs. Tremendous response in the country. But the trick with it, with it was that you're not giving the subsidy back to the government. Nobody wants to give money back to the government. You know, I'd rather use the money myself. But you're giving it to an identified poor person, and there's a website. Now, here's um, this part of the publicity on it, a gift of good health to others and a cleaner environment for yourself. And that recognizes the fact that the, you're cleaning up Delhi's air a bit when you uh, introduce LPG in rural areas because of the outdoor air pollution component. You know, social media is great. The most well-paid, most well-identified actor in India, you know, has a little message uh, on the website if you want to listen. Um, they, um, they gave up their subsidies. Health is a message on this. Make a poor man's kitchen clean. Other than I don't think any men have kitchens. It's, it's a good message. Um, extensive social marketing. So here's the um, uh, scroll of honor. You, you, these are the people who gave up their subsidy on the left. And there's the beneficiary, identified beneficiary. And of course, the media ran out to make sure these people really existed. And they do. Notice this is 100,000 pages on this website. No one lack of pages. Huge effort. Very smart, scroll of honor, get a letter from the prime minister, an identified person gets your, your. So it's an internal foreign aid program. And depending on how you calculate it, it's an internal foreign aid program equal to the net foreign aid for India. Real foreign aid coming into India. India gives foreign aid, so as well as receives it. And it actually, um, so the net is about the same as this uh, internal foreign aid from the middle class to the poor. That's a remarkable thing. I mean, whatever else you think about this, it's a remarkable idea that you can take what we were embarrassed by, the idea that there were subsidies. Always embarrassed when I talk to an economist about it. Suddenly it's an asset. Quite a remarkable thing. And in fact, you know, I'm working with my students in California to actually identify subsidies in the California that we could give up, get people to give up and go for beneficial things. India, you know, is providing an idea that might go to elders. Um, this is ten and a half million. I think it's higher than that. Uh, anyway, but this wasn't enough. The ten million or whatever it was, you know, was making a big, uh, was making a dent in that seven hundred million households. But it wasn't making a big enough dent. So last year, in the budget speech, um, the uh, you know the I guess it's the finance minister presented. I know country cooking gas cylinders were considered an upper middle class luxury. Gradually, it spread to the middle class, but the poor didn't have access. Women of India face the curse of smoke. According to experts, having an open fire in the kitchen is like burning 400 cigarettes. Time has come to remedy this situation. We've decided to embark on a massive mission to provide LPG. The scheme will continue to, um, you know, to 2019. It's going to be five, you know, five crore. That's on top of the Give It Up campaign. Another you know, one crore there, so that's six crore of households. That's starting to dig in a lot into the 700 million people that were you know, without it. And um, empower women, protect their health, reduce drudgery, and the time spent on cooking. This is the um, Ujwala campaign, as you know it now. It's still underway in a big way. Um, you know, you see these, these posters all over the place. Um, uh, this one says, clean fuel, better life. But they're focusing on the respect for women. I mean, the fact that it's uh, you know, changing the status of women. And as you may know, in the, in the UP election that uh, recently the BJP party did well in, um, better than people expected, the newspapers accounted to the LPG program. That um, people, poor people liked the fact that they were you know, being offered LPG and um, voted for the party that had given it to them. Um, and actually more women voted on that election than any other previous election, maybe partly because of this extra status given to women. Now, how do they give this women status? Only women can get the, you sign up for Ujwala, only the women's bank account will count. You can only use women. And this is a trick that the health sector has learned a long time ago. If you're going to give money to households, conditional cash transfer, they do something and you give them money for it, 
Only give it to women. It's much less likely to go to beer and, cig beer and cigarettes if it goes to women than if it goes to men. So this, you know, is part of the, what's happening here. Though the, objection, uh, the objectives are empowering women, protecting their health, reducing the serious health hazards, reducing the number of deaths, preventing young children, and so forth and so on. Now, out of the research literature where we find these things with, this use of the, uh, with the use of biomass fuel. People need to pay for their, uh, um, without the Ujuala campaign, they have to pay for their own connection fee. It's about 30, you know, it's about um, 1,800 rupees or something like that. It's too much for many poor people. So the Ujuala pay, uh, program pays for it. And, the, and they have to, um, you know, the fuel, however, comes on the same basis that everybody else in the country um, subsidized at, at around 450. Um, and um, I'm going to, so everybody gets a subsidy, including the Ujuala uh, people who get their free connections under the Ujuala program. So um, they're also adding 10,000 new distributors, supposedly. If you're going to ex you know, reach out into these poor areas and um, the rural parts of the country, you, you can't use the existing distributors, and most of them are kind of focused in cities anyway. You need to have a new set of distributors. Now, the idea is to get 10,000, but um, uh, it's been slow hiring new distributors. It's difficult. It's a very different financial position you're in to extend into a remote rural area. The roads are more difficult, the, the housing is further, is more dispersed. It's not the same profit line as, you know, as working in a city, having 40,000 households within easy um, distance. Uh, so it's harder to get distributors. So this is something that needs to be worked on more, is maybe new kinds of distributorships, not with the same requirements as the old ones. Uh, there's a, this is a neat part of it, not so well known. There's a national no-fault insurance scheme because some people are afraid of LPG. It's going to blow up or burn down their house or whatever. So now there's a, a toll-free number to call. Everybody's given a card. If you have an accident, you, you, you're paid for your, the loss of your house up to six lakhs. Um, the $1.2 billion, this is 8,000 crore um, earmarked, public money earmarked for this program. And that should pay for these 50 million connections in, by um, 2019. Um, and all money only to in women's bank accounts. So um, gold is 50 million, minus those double connections that were deleted because of the Paul Wall scheme, maybe 34 million. It's, these numbers get a little hard to figure out exactly, plus those from the Give It Up campaign, plus normal growth in the middle class. Um, so they're currently, well, this is a little out of date, to more than 200 million active accounts, 70% of the country already. In 2019, 60 million new connections, um, so maybe 80% of the country will be covered. And now starting to think of designing the program for the post-Ujuala, or the Ujuala II, if you like, uh, that it will occur after 2019. Now, Modi, of course, wants to sit there and brag about uh, Modi uh, Ujuala I when he um, hopes to get himself reelected. But it doesn't cover the whole country. It, we need to have more, and we need to have an Ujuala II program. So why is this work in India? Well. The vast infrastructure already in place. I mean, pipelines, bottling plants, cylinder manufacturing, port facilities, 18,000 distributors. You know, it's sort of a critical mass. It was ready for this expansion. I think an important part is that the companies that distribute the LPG are not, they're private, so they have the efficiency of a private company, but they're still owned by the government, you know, 57% or something. So they, you know, the minister says, we're going to have a social program on LPG. They still listen. This is rather unique. You know, they're efficient like a private company, but they have to listen to the government. My country, I can tell you, if the Minister of Energy told the oil companies to do something, they would just call their lawyers and they're not going to do anything. They're purely private. So, you know, it's, a, it's a kind of a sweet spot, if you will, between government-run companies, which are so inefficient everywhere, and completely private companies that are, you know, have their own agendas, they're just they're not going to care about the government, and, you know, this sweet spot that India represents. And a massive commitment from top to bottom, from, you know, the distributors to the prime minister. This is Modi's, I mean, just took a speech, recent speech of his, um, talking about, um, you know, the Paul Hall campaign and the uh, 
Give It Up campaign and the um, Ujwala campaign in a recent speech. Um, this is a speech he gave in the U.S. when he visited. Um, when I think of a developed India, I think of a healthy India, particularly the good health of the women and children. Well, I mean, you know, this is music to my ears as a health scientist working in India. And jam. Now, this is not strawberry jam. I don't know if you know what jam means, but jam stands for John Har, are they uh, electronic bank accounts, odd Har cards, and mobile phones. And, um, you know, these didn't exist three years ago. We couldn't have done this program three years ago or four years ago because these things didn't exist. Now they do. It's very hard to pretend to be somebody you're not because of the odd Har card. Now, I realize there's, there are you know, privacy you know, concerns and civil... Uh, the rights concerns with the auto cards, but if you're using them to focus subsidies, it's, they're great. You can, very hard for someone to get, you know, nobody's going to get two auto cards, as far as we know. Um, so cashless transactions are coming into play. I mean, uh, the, I just heard that the government has asked for 50% of LPG to be bought in cashless transactions within a year. That may be tough to do. It's only about 10% now, but that's the direction we're going. So India, the, this program is leading the way to the cashless society that is part of the Indian government's, you know, goals. Um, of course, now a little bit the downside of this. Just providing affordable access to LPG doesn't mean people move 100%. Leave, you know, a lot of households, when they first get LPG, you can look at their records of how much they're using, and they're only using one or two cylinders a year. You know, so they're making tea when their sister comes over for dinner. They're not using it 100%, which is considered to be six or seven cylinders. But, so, not everybody instantly switches. You know, there's people who taste, some people think that, you know, the doll tastes different, better with biomass and, you know, all of these kinds of things. People do not shift 100% instantly to a new technology. But over time, all of you did, you know, your grandmothers all used biomass. I mean, it was 95% of the country in those days. Now none of you use biomass. We know that transition will take place. Every cuisine, cuisine can be cooked with gas. But it won't hap doesn't happen instantly. But it can't happen, I mean, I would argue, it can't happen unless you have access. But once you have access, you have to do other things to promote usage. So we know that 60% of the world uses gas. We use gas in the US, Europe uses gas, Japan uses gas. We know it works, it cooks every cuisine, it's aspirational, people like it, people want it, but they don't necessarily start using it the day they get it 100%. So, India is moving, uh, what else is being done? I mean, I'm not going to talk much about this, but they're moving to eliminate kerosene subsidies. Everybody I talk to in the government, uh, Ashutosh and the others say, it's going to, they're going to go. They're, it's really a pernicious subsidy. Why is it pernicious? Because most of the fuel goes into diesel trucks. It doesn't go to benefit the people. Kerosene is a very bad actor. We know there are health effects of kerosene are worse than bio smoke, actually. Kerosene is a heavy climate uh, actor also, a very large. It's, uh, kerosene smokes about 95% black carbon, you know, heavy. Uh, there are lots and lots of reasons to not subsidize kerosene. Maybe 30, 40 years ago it was considered you were helping the poor, but you're not helping the poor, you're hurting the poor. And now you've got a clean fuel available for cooking. Problem with kerosene has been that people needed it for lighting. India has not electrified its population, as you know. But actually, there are much better lights now, solar uh, and um, just rechargeable LED lights that you, know, you can buy in the shop now are really cheap. You see them on the night markets. Everybody's using LED lights. You don't need kerosene. Kerosene's lousy light. So getting rid of the subsidy will save a lot of money. And, of course, I'm arguing that that money should be considered ours, you know, that we use it to more subsidize LPG, that it's part of our, the country's program toward clean household fuel, and you save it over here by getting rid of kerosene subsidies and put it over there to promote LPG. But LPG is not the only gas out there. PNG, as it's called, um, pipe natural gas, is coming in in the cities. Delhi's filled with it now. 205 cities have plans for PNG. So why do I care about PNG in Delhi? It's because, you know, I, my flat here in house costs that we rent, our landlady got PNG. It means she gave up her LPG. That LPG can now be moved to a rural area without importing some more. She gave up the subsidy. That subsidy can be moved to a rural area. I mean, so it's all one system. So more PNG comes in, 
the better it is for the country as a whole. And any gas is good it's for, uh, you know, it's clean when um, burned for cooking. And biogas is another program that should be a push where, where it works. Um, and so, displaces LPG. So, my argument is um, that in the health field, we don't talk about subsidies. Sure, you give vaccines to rural people, poor people, but that's not a subsidy. You build schools, primary kids in, in the villages. That's not a subsidy. Those are social investments. If you can target something that's beneficial to poor people, that's a social investment. You're improving everybody's lives by doing that. So the question is, can we target LPG subsidies sufficiently, and we are starting to target them better, to call them social investments? That's my goal. And because, you know, an LPG is definitely better for everybody's health, but it's not good if, you know, the middle class is still getting a lot of subsidies. So if you want to get, take it away from the middle class or ask them to give it up or trick them out of it or however you can get it and apply it to poor people, call it social investment. It's not a subsidy. Um, so new directions make target subsidies even better. Embrace modern, you know, information technology to do so. Jam for example, um, work with others, entirely different distribution modes, you know, maybe um, women's groups and, and uh, other um, um, groups and different kinds of distribution modes that are, might be more effective in rural areas. So in essence, India has found a way to provide LPG access to hundreds of millions of people. We know, however, that continue people to continue to use biomass fuel, many people do, so the question for us, you know, myself and others who are working in this area is how do we accelerate the natural transition? So we've got the access suddenly because of these programs. How do we accelerate the transition to truly 100% use? So how do we promote use? But this is very common in the health field all the time. Just providing access to latrines doesn't mean people use them. You can give people condoms, they don't use them. Low salt foods, they don't use them. Bed nets, they don't use them. Institutional delivery facilities for babies, they don't use them. You have to, you have programs to promote usage of all these things. So the technology is certainly part of it. You have to have a latrine before you can use it, but then you have to have ways to accelerate usage. So, but as I say, this is very common in the health area, and we've developed a range of techniques to promote this usage. Um, and. Um, all of these require usage to get the health benefits. So it's no good if the condoms are sitting in the, you know, in the drawer in the bedroom. You have to use them every time. And India's had a very good record of getting people to use condoms, as, as an example, through behavioral change. They've cut off, cut, cut the HIV epidemic off at the knees in India. And a few years ago, we thought India was going to go the way of Africa and have terrible HIV epidemic. But massive, you know, social marketing and working with NGOs and, and, and local health groups change people's behavior. And that's a very fundamental behavior, you know, in, in the bedroom, so to speak. Well, we can do that with LPG, too. So how best to encourage usage? Well, um, my research going on now in the project in Maharashtra is to, um, and Chana in Tamil Nadu, is to identify vulnerable populations particularly open to behavioral change. Pregnant women, their, their, their behavior is changing dramatically. There are a lot of programs aimed at pregnant women in the country. There are 15 million women giving birth, you know, who live in biomass using households. It's not a small number. 15 million, if you were able to reach these over a few years, you would get a lot of the women in the country. Um, and why do we think that it might be a good idea to do so? I'm not, it's the only health data I'm gonna show is that cook fire smoke, and these are uh, 12 studies, half of them done in South Asia, show that it'll be a 35% reduction in low birth weight. Now, low birth weight is below 2,500 grams. Why do we care about low birth weight? Because there's a huge number of health effects related to low birth weight, and unfortunately, these are some of the health effects. Unfortunately, India has one of the worst records for low birth weight of any place in the world. According to UNICEF, it's the third highest rate, 27%. You know, down there with Yemen and you know Pakistan, places you probably don't want to be compared to. Um, so uh, something has to be done from a health standpoint about the low birth weight problem. And we think you know that one of the reasons is the 700 million people 
living in biomass homes. So um, there are a lot of uh, conditional cash transfer programs already for pregnant women. They, uh, the current program is 2,000 rupees, but the government just announced it's going to go to 6,000 rupees. Um, you know, delivered to electronic bank accounts always. I mean, this all of this is made more efficient by you know the digital India. So we're proposing a bright motherhood um, initiative, perhaps that might follow the current Ajwala program, provide LPG to pregnant women free. But remember, pregnancies only last nine months, so you're not giving a lifetime supply. You're providing it in a time period when her behavior is changing. You hope she would like the fuel. At the end of that time, she would continue to use it use ASHA workers as the um, medium to reach these pregnant women, which is what we're doing in Maharashtra, use bank accounts. In that, you know, you only get the pregnant women for the six months, uh, you know, of the last six months of the pregnancy, so it's about 2,000 rupees. It's not even expensive compared to what women are getting, going to be getting already of 6,000 rupees. If we can show that it does good, it's a social, another social investment on top of the current one for pregnant women. I mean, to me, you know, it's um, pretty much, as they, you know, we say in the U.S., a no-brainer. But we, do, we are trying to show the data that it makes, it makes a difference. That might engender a lifetime behavioral change, and that she would like the LPG at the end of this. Um, you know, if you think about it in the context of you know, the larger scale, there are 900,000 ASHA workers in the country. This would be the fourth largest army in the world. It was an army. There are maybe, um, you know, about half a million, there will be a half a million distributor, uh, half a million workers working for distributors for, of LPG in rural areas, not counting the cities. Well, this is a huge army out there. Bring these two together on a common purpose. The ASHA workers are already dealing with every pregnancy in the country. Bring in LPG, using the local distributors to do that. They can, be, they can do more together on this than they can do separately. Another consideration is to um, look at changing the subsidy pattern. I would find get rid of subsidies for more of the middle class. You know, people earning seven lakhs a year, they don't need a subsidy. They're going to use LPG anyway. I wouldn't suggest taking it away from them overnight, and you'll get riots in the street. But over time, you can um, reduce the subsidy to them and increase the subsidy to the lower you know, quintiles of the population. And we've done some calculations on this. Now, it's not so easy to differentiate people, who are the poor, who are not so poor, who are less poor, and who are, you know. But this is an effort that would, of course, be advantageous for a lot of things India is trying to do. And even in a crude way of reducing it for the middle class substantially, but maintaining the subsidy that now exists or enhancing it for the, Uj the BPL uh, community that is covered by Ujwala would be a good idea. Um, so what are the barriers to usage? Knowledge, people don't know about the health benefits. They, they think uh, LBG is beyond them, that they can't get them. Well, that information can be provided. Unfortunately, we found people don't believe the distributors. They think the distributors are out the, you know, Fleece them, the, that information has to come separately, not through the LPG system, it has to come through the healthcare system or doctors or ASHA workers or Aganwadi workers or you know, school teachers or whatever. And that's something that really hasn't been organized yet in the rural areas. Reliabilities of refills. I mean, you run out of uh, LPG on Saturday night, you can't get a refill till next Friday. What are you going to do in between? You've got to cook, you go back to biomass. Well, what do you guys do? When you, you all probably have two cylinders because you, you, know, you run out and you can't get the supply for a day or two, you still need to cook. Two cylinders, I, I believe, are the way to deal with this re reliability issue. You can't expect those distributors to deliver fuel in the next day out in a rural area that's very far and the roads are bad. Why not two cylinders? Um, cost, now that's an issue for as many poor people. Of course, the upfront costs are handled by the um, uh, Juala program, but in many cases the stove, people have to buy that on credit, or you know, no interest credit, but credit. Um, but that may might be considered. Some states do provide stoves, but others don't, most don't. Refill amount, I mean, so you, sometimes, in a few months ago, the cost of LPG internationally was 800 a, a, a cylinder. Now, if you had to put up 800, 
to get the, your refill. Now you got 350 back because the price you're in the guaranteed price is 450, but there were people were you know didn't feel like they wanted to put up 800, even though they knew they were getting 450 back or 350 back. But I think there are ways using um, jam uh, to uh, you know make that so they don't really ever have to come up with the 800. But you don't want to subsidize the fuel directly because that'll go back to the old system where it's um, diverted to other purposes. So this is um, a challenge for those of people who work think of you know the electronic bank accounts and how mobile phones would work. The long term, you know, the big long term issue is of course the recurring costs. Well, we have some ideas about this. One is to provide with you know, combine with pregnancy benefits and give her give her a free trial for six months while she's pregnant. You hope she would like it and use it more after she's finished. Target subsidies more effectively, as we talked about. So the poor get higher subsidies. So their, you know, their less fraction of their income goes into the, the fuel, but the middle class give up or, you know, or are deprived of their subsidies over time. Combined with employment benefits in the rural employment scheme. You know, actually, women actually do have alternative uses in most, in many villages for their time. You know, 150 rupees a day in the rural employment scheme. A few days you paid for your LPG that year. So you could link the LPG connections with the rural employment scheme. Give, them her, give her an extra 10 days a year if she, you know, signs up for the LPG program. There are various ways to think about that. Now this is a, you know, a change to a full opt-in system. And so instead of, you know, right now you can opt out of the LPG. You can voluntarily give up your subsidy or you cannot sign up for it in the first place. But what about giving everybody that option every year or every two years, let's say? You, you have to say, you have to say that my income is less, you pick a number, five lakhs. If your income is above five lakhs, you don't have up, can't get the subsidy. Now, of course, the government cannot check your income today. We, they don't have sufficient income tax records. But how many people are going to want to lie on a, you know, on a form? And there are people who are going to lie, but a lot of people would not be. And there's a lot of research showing that you opt in or opt out makes a big difference in how much people respond. It's the difference between 30% and 70%, basically. So that may be a way of you know, getting the middle class, even more of the middle class, to give up their subsidies. And once middle class gives up your subsidies, it's, you're targeting the remaining subsidy better, it's a social investment. And, um, but, this is my last point, please do not give up the subsidy for everybody. And I know there's some effort in the government to do that. Mr. Jindal tells me it's not likely to succeed. We're hoping it'll be retained for the Ujwala and the poor people. Um, but, and maybe it's okay if it goes away for the middle class, but it would be a sort of a disaster, you know, that would reverse a lot of the benefits that the program has already achieved if you gave away the subsidies, you know, to the poor. Not that you want to subsidize the poor forever, but remember, it's a social investment. Ten years, these people won't be poor anymore. They'll be healthier and wealthier, and you can slowly move the subsidy away. But just now, as we you know, subsidize um, you know, food for the poor and employment, rural employment and a range of other things, health care and so forth, schooling, don't turn it all into the private sector immediately just because of some theoretical argument, uh, economic arguments. So I'm finishing up here. This is what happened. But what if something different had happened? What if we'd had this conversation, you know, we'd had a, a government like the Modi government who wanted to do something back in 1990 instead? And they had greatly expanded LPG at that point. That would have meant the number of people using solid fuel would have gone down dramatically. And that would have been a growth rate instead of 5.5%, which is what occurred, barely keeping up with the middle class, 9% instead. Now, that's a big increase in growth rate, but that's exactly what's happening today. The, the government is now, you know, in, on a... On a uh, basically to do this, except in, starting in 2015, not in 1990, but over 10, 20 years, it could make a big difference. Greatly increase the number of people using clean fuel. And that, nine, nine, that one, basically one million premature deaths, how was that compared to? You're always comparing you know, one thing versus another. That is compared to using LPG. That's how we did those calculations. That's the data we have. 
but you have to use the LPG nearly, well, you know, let's say 90 or 95 percent. I mean, you don't get the benefit if you only use it 50 percent. So it means not only connecting people, but persuading them in some way to use it. So is it a Chula trap or a clean fuel gap? I'm beginning to think it's more the latter. Now India has found a way maybe to reduce that clean fuel gap. So basically this is the Indian you know, energy ladder, as they, we call it in the field. The dirty, uh, dirty fuels are used by poor people down on the lower left. Clean fuels are used by rich people up on the right. What do we do? Basically, what we want to do is fill in that site. We want poor people to use clean fuels. So how do we do that? Well, one is um, get rid of coal and kerosene, which are nasty in their own right. And maybe you can make biomass burn cleanly. It hasn't happened yet, but there's been a lot of progress, so I wouldn't give that up, making the available clean. But certainly, you can do better at making the clean available. LPG, starting with LPG, but sure, electricity. Parts of the country are starting to cook, you know, with induction cook stoves. Kerala, for example, Machal Pradesh, Gujarat, places with good electricity supply. And natural gas. So you fill in that gap, coming up from the bottom, maybe you can be able to do that, but certainly we can do it by going over from the right. So, um, um, my website has um, a lot of materials and publications and things. Um, best to find it just by Googling my name. Thank you very much.